the brephos, the napios, and the pice deal with the baby stages, the childhood stages, and their focus is on security. Security in Christ. At about five or six years old, a child becomes a technon, which means a child under training. Like for kindergarten, first grade, all that, four, five, six. In the Jewish uh, culture up to about 13, when they became a huios, an adult, they began the adult phases of life. These stages basically correspond to, to get, for us to be able to kind of see how the Christian life is, the way I see it anyway. The baby stages give way to the child training stages. In the babyhood, we get our security, who we are in Christ. These are all the things that we're studying right now, all these, all these, four, these doctrines that are related to the 50 things. That's who you are. That's your identity. Once you're secure, early, if, you, if this went progressively, you would start working on your skills. Of course, you're doing it all along. Filling of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, faith cycle, trusting God, dealing with issues, prayer, all these different functional skills as a Christian. Once you develop your skills, i.e. You, you learn your armor, you learn how to put it on, you learn how to use the sword, you learn how to fight as a soldier. You there? The Lord turns and says, now, I want to deal with the person inside the armor. I want to deal with motive. I want to deal with beliefs and ideas. I want to deal with who and what you are, not just skills, but I want to, we're not talking about learning how to do something and being really good at it. We're talking about you, your heart, your soul, your spirit, connected to God. Who are you? What are you? What comes out of you? We've been indwelt by the power that raised Christ from the dead. Right? That's pretty powerful stuff, right? Created the universe with a spoken word. That person with that power is inside of you. We have all knowledge of God's Word, just tons of it. question I have for myself is why, with that power and that understanding, is not my production for Christ much more powerful? The song we just sang, Prone to Wander. Why am I prone? I got the Holy Spirit. I got the... Why am I prone to wander? Well... There's certainly a reason. Listen, here's what, here's what is not helpful. For me to point all that out and then fuss at you about it. <laughs> like, what are you supposed to do about it? Because you can't really do anything unless you understand how God has set this up for you to grow out of that into who he wants you to be. So let's talk about it. Knowing how to do a thing is critical to accomplishing it. If a pastor knows the Bible, what, the, what, the, uh, what walking with the Lord looks like, but he can only browbeat his people, which, listen, that's all I did for years. I pointed out the fact that we weren't living up to this, and I would just fuss about, hey, listen, you got to try harder. As if trying harder and in producing more human effort would somehow, see, don't work, does it? All it does is put people in guilt and anxiety. So, if he fails, which I'm talking to me, to explain and emphasize the grace assets of how do we walk with the Lord, he tempts him to guilt for not being able, tends them to human good as they attempt it by human power for selfish reasons. 
divine mechanics are required to live the supernatural life, and I'm describing myself. That's my life. That's where that came from. The principle. What is expressed through our souls is rooted or sourced in the beliefs of our heart. If you, if you want to know what you believe, now, you can believe something to be true and know that it's true and yet still believe other things that you believed previously and you know what you really believe in first place by what you do, what you feel, what you say, and what you do. That's because that's how it works. Whatever you believe and operate on through faith in the moment is what you produce. You got that? So what are you producing? I mean, step back and look at your life and go, hmm, what is my life producing? Well, if most of it is worldly focused, making a living, paying the bills, then those are the things that, quote, you, look, you say, I've got all this knowledge of God. I spent all these years developing it, but my heart is still connected more so to the things of the world. And, and, you, I don't know why. Why? How do I change this? Well, the reason why. Of course, we're born without God. We're born in Adam's sin, and we're born all messed up. <clears throat> There's some technical terms for that, but I want to just say we're messed up. And listen, before a baby is born, right before a baby's born, a rush of, of neurons are, are sent to his brain so that when he comes out, there's more neurons in his brain than he'll ever need. Those neurons are all sitting there waiting and ready as this child begins to experience life and begins to form impressions and beliefs and ideas about life. Those neurons, physical in the brain, hook up together and form patterns or habits of thought. Let's say, like me, you're 21 before you get saved, which I probably, I don't know. I had spent 21 years forming all these worldly ideas and philosophical, all of my brain was hooked up to that, all patterned up with these neurons. You understand that? Give me a nod, yeah. Then I got saved. Holy Spirit comes in. I begin to learn. I begin to learn. I love this stuff. This is great. I know it's true. But why do I keep going back over here? I'm going to tell you why. Because you're still in this body. And this body has been ingrained, not just trained, but ingrained to be worldly, to put self before God still in it there's no escape I mean there's an escape but it's not optional at this point I mean it's not desirable I'd like to stay for a little while and still work on this so has God provided a means for the spiritual person the soul the spirit the heart the mind to be spiritual and deal with this are you following this and the answer is yes. First of all, it's called the filling of the Spirit. You're indwelt, but every time that you go over here, it, it produces sin and human good. Every time. The moment you let go of the Spirit, whoosh, your old brain habits and body habits and everything else take over and here you are doing the same thing you've always done. Thinking the same way, looking at it the same way, operating the same way. It's about me, me, me. So God said, if you'll confess your sin, I'll put you back in the spirit. Then if you'll, look, 
Then one day you say, I don't have to go back over there. See, when you got saved and you were filled with the Spirit, indwelt and then filled initially at that moment, technically speaking, you didn't ever have to go over here again. Because the power that raised Jesus from the dead is now empowering you to be spiritual. But you're still in the body. And the habit is to go over here. That's the default. So, what do we do? Boy, we want to be spiritual, but we keep getting drawn over here and sucked over here and boom, boom, boom. So you start growing. And the more you let go of that, the more you can hang on to this. It's that simple. It's that simple. But it's not that simple. So, now... We understand that whatever we believe in our heart is what produces our behavior. Behavior would be thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. So, as we observe our thoughts, feelings, words, and actions, it should point back to what we're using, what logic, what idea, what belief we're using is, our, is the basis of our behavior. Would you agree with that? The love of money is what? No. Nope. It's not the root. It's a root. It's just one of many roots. Hebrews 12, 15 says what? Root of bitterness. These are roots. Roots are core beliefs that produce behavior. The analogy, the metaphor is to a plant. You plant a root, produces a plant, produces fruit. Whatever fruit is coming in your life that shows you clearly what the root is. Now, if you find yourself, first half, complain, complain, oh boy. Am I convicted? Oh boy. Complain, complain, complain. As soon as things start to go a little bit sideways, according to my idea, and my idea is, of course, based on what's good for me in my circumstances, because I still believe that circumstances are what's going to make me happy, dummy. Still believe that. Still, look, I know it's not true, but I still operate on it. I still go there and tell myself, this is not going my way. And I get all, start to get tense. And I want to fuss at somebody. Poor Rhonda. Behavior, fruit. That's fruit. Look and listen. None of that ever, with me, most of the time that never comes out. You may or may not ever know anything about that with me. But it's there. I go there. But every... But when I do now, I'm starting to realize, what am I telling myself? What am I picturing in my mind and telling myself that's causing me to believe that this type of thought and feeling and viewpoint of the situation and then resultant behavior, what is that? And here's the number one question, is it from God? Is it God's will in this particular situation that I go there? <laughs> Normally, would you agree? Normally, it's not God's. Therefore, whatever root belief is in me, what should I do with it? Wait, I should chop the top off of it, right, and cover it up. Wait. Wait. I got an idea. Let's take a lot of doctrine, chop the top off of it, and cover it up with a lot of doctrine. Think that'll work? <laughs> Did you know Tina bought this little pool? It's just a little kiddie pool, you know? Put it in the backyard because it's so hot. A blade of grass poked through the bottom of that thing and was growing in the middle of that pool. 
that's your old root pushing up through your doctrine. You cut the thing off, look, what you got to do? You got to pull it out. So, what does God do? What is God's plan for this? First of all, it's called, if you will, turn in your Bible, or, or go to Romans 5. Romans 5, 3 through 5. Well, and while you're going there, I'm going to read you Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. Deuteronomy, you shall recall all the way the Lord led you into the desert these 40 years that he might humble you and expose are testing you to expose what was in your heart. What did the desert do? I mean, they walked out of Egypt, they were ecstatic. Yay, God! But when they got to the desert, it exposed what was really in them. That's what it does. Romans 5. You get Romans 5? Let's see if we can get there myself. Romans 5. He's, Paul's in, in verse 1 and 2. He's rejoicing over who we are in Christ and the fact that we're going to be glorified when he is revealed. Verse 3, we not only rejoice in this, but we rejoice in our adversities. Same thing James says. Why? We know that adversity or tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces perseverance proof or proven character and proven character hope and he goes on to explain the fact that see this do you see the development idea started with what adversity so let me give you my take i'm gonna give you three r's the first is reveal the pressures in life are designed to reveal what's in your heart. And if you have spent all these years purifying your heart from your old way of thinking, reestablished all new beliefs and ideas, and this, this is all that's in your heart, then, you, then you're Jesus. But... The pressure is used to expose whatever's in your heart. Now, I see in childhood, <clears throat> listen, in childhood, there's a view of life that, see, in childhood, we still hold on to the idea that our, that, that our circumstances are of the happiness. Everything's about our situation. And our whole relationship with God is about getting God to fix this, fix my life, fix my kids, fix my marriage, fix me, fix me, so that I can enjoy what little time I have here in a really wonderful way. You, you, can you relate to that? I sure can. That's most of what we've prayed for our whole life, for God to make what we live with, our situation, what we want it to be. As you move into the really mature stages, you begin to realize this isn't about that. In fact, the circumstances and the situations are more about changing you. They're about changing you. If you, and I've taught this and we've taught this, that the, all these doctrines are like uh, tools in a toolbox that circumstance comes up and you go pick out the right tool and you fix your situation. See, I'm still situationally focused as if the situation is the real issue. I see a different model. I see the adversity coming and the tools used to fix me, not the situation. Now, I'm all about fixing situations, being smart, having common sense, 
praying for what you want. Oh, yeah, look, I'm not saying don't desire good, good circumstances or pray for them or ask for them. I'd ask for the moon. I mean, ask for the stars and might get the moon. That's David when he's praying for this kid. He said, who knows what God would do? Ha! Be careful what you ask for, though. You know, Lord, I want lots of money. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I see a different model. I see the adversities. I see our life is about molding the soul. And whatever the situations are and however they go and however they change, quote, good or bad, up or down, my way or the highway, doesn't matter. Because it's all intended for good. And what you say, well, what's good? Good is changing me. Here, here's good. It is no longer I who live. That's good. But Christ who lives in me. Do you see the difference between our childish way of thinking, which says, fix my life, make my life what I want it to be? And the mature place that we... And listen, if you're there, I'm not fussing. I'm not putting you down at all. I'm just saying, you're not... Don't stay there. Don't stay there. Look, you're on a journey, and you're at a point and a place, and where you are is where you're supposed to be. Devote yourself to go into the next place with God. And I believe that next place, at least for me, is for me to use my life to reveal me so that I can see the things that I ingrained into myself all along my life that, that, that are not from God and that I can enter into a purification and a transformation that God can f help me free me from these things. So, reveal to see it. Remove... And there's all kind of passages on that. Romans 13, 12, lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. James 1 and 22, 1, 21, lay aside filth and wickedness, receiving the implanted word. 1 Peter 2, laying aside guile, malice, hypocrisy, envy, hurtful talk, desire the pure milk of the word. There's all, it's everywhere. Every, when you start to, to realize it, everywhere that he says a positive thing, he talks about, pulling out these roots. He talks in different ways, laying off things, taking off clothes, layers of clothing. There's a removing part. And, and listen, listen, here's how it works, simple. Okay? Let me get you back for just a second. You see, you produce a sin or a series of sins. Your relationship, you realize, I'm in trouble over here. And you go, boy, of course you want to confess that stuff. And God never is, is tempting you to do that stuff. Don't ever think that. But he knows you will, and he allows it. What you're looking for in all those things is not just to cut the top off of it. You're looking for the root. What, is, what am I telling myself? What am I seeing in my head that I'm buying into once again that causes me to go there that's what needs to change that's what needs to be confronted challenged and rejected that logic that says I have a right to be angry I have a right to be upset I have a right to feel depressed my niche is, I have a counseling niche of sorts, but I love to teach. But I'm still a teacher. But how many times have I heard, if you, only, if you really knew what I had to put up with? Every one of us feel that way. If you just knew my situation. I mean, if you really wanted to talk about that, talk to Rhonda. I mean, her situation is dire. But I'm just teasing. I'm a wonderful man to live with. I'm just a peachy guy. Uh, 
There's a removal part, and this is the Bible. If you read the Bible, you see it everywhere. Take off, remove, get rid of. There's no escaping it. Then replace. You have to have knowledge. You have to understand what the plan of God is, how the tools work, who you are in Christ, the security that you have. All these 50 things lessons are all about establishing who we are in Christ, not just for us, but for all these people on the Internet, these hundreds of people that are listening to these things over and over again. They're like, I've never heard this kind of stuff. The grace ministry has to continue past us. At least past me. It has to go on. It's not about me or what I get to do or not do. It's about God and the, and the principle of grace being explained. Now, what people do with it is up to them. But it has to go on. And that's our job, in my opinion. So, there's a adversity reveals through primarily how you feel. Because most of us are socialized not to say and do stupid things. I mean, when you get all upset, you're not going to run over a policeman or something, you know. Or, you know, slap your wife. Or you're going to keep it bottled up. But inside, you're not content with your circumstances. The Holy Spirit produces contentment with your circumstances. He produces peace, joy, love, all these things. If you're not experiencing that, then the root you're using is not of the Lord. And the adversity is intended to show you that, just like the law revealed the need for Christ. God uses adversity to reveal our old man's stuff. He shows it to us through the desert. It's when you see it, you have to begin to challenge it and, and tell yourself, I'm not going to think that way anymore. And if you can catch yourself in the moment of going there, you're going there again to fuss. You've looked at the circumstances and you've gone, Arr! it's your fault. And you're going to fuss. If you can catch yourself right there and go, no, hello, hello. See, that's where the magic is. You can, you can, Gnosticize about all this stuff if you want. Ruminate from a distance. It's when you get right in that pit and you wake up to the to what you're choosing, to what you're telling yourself. When you wake up on the inside and go, "What am I saying to myself that's making me do this?" And you catch yourself and you go, "Whoa! No! 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 I'm not doing that." Listen, you catch yourself like that enough times, you know it'll happen. You'll erase that baby, and that thing won't come back. That temptation won't come back. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I hope these things make sense. I really do. We know that you've made a way for us to have victory, not just to know a lot, but to have victory, to be those people full of so much passion and love and mercy and grace that overwhelms those who sin against us, that overwhelms a world. They, they just can't help but see us and notice us, Father. We need that so bad in this nation right now. Real, true Christians who are living lives that are so powerful that can't be denied. I don't have it, and I want it. And I think many here want it. We want this, Father, and we're willing to do. Help us to see the how. How do we get there? And ask it in Christ's name. Amen.